welcome to our second Tea with Tops. I'm Jennifer Slush, the current Tops Chair, and I have with me Allison Shaver, the past chair. That's no, okay, Allison. Um, <laughs> we also are really pleased to host Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. Um, Dr. Loftus is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Irvine. She holds faculty positions in the Department of, Phys of Psychological Science, the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society, and the School of Law. She received her PhD in psychology from Stanford University, and since then she has published over 20 books and over 600 scientific articles. Loftus's research has focused on the malleability of human memory. She has been recognized for her research with seven honorary doctorates and election to numerous prestigious societies, including the National Academy of Sciences. She is past president of the Association for Psychological Science, the Western Psychological Science, Western Psychological Association, and the American Psychology Law Society. Loftus's memory research has led her to being called an expert witness or consultant in hundreds of cases. Some of the more well-known cases include the McMartin Preschool Molestation Case, the Hillside Strangler, the Abscom Cases, the Trial of the Officers Accused in the Rodney King Beating, the Menendez Brothers, the Bosnian War Trials in The Hague, the Oklahoma Bombing Case, and the litigation involving Michael Jackson, Martha Stewart, Scooter Libby, Oliver North, Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, and the Duke University lacrosse players. Wow, such a decorated career. Um, so I am so excited to start this with Dr. Loftus. Um, so from the bio I just read, you've built quite a career. Um, and when you first started out, there weren't probably very many female psychologists around. And now you're like, the single most influential female psychologist of your generation. What's that like? Oh, well, taking me back to grad school, yes, um, I, there was only one uh, tenured, um, well, one f female faculty member when, when I was in, in grad school. That was Eleanor Maccabee at the time. Um, and so we've come a long way in psychology to ha having lots and lots of, of females and lots of very, uh, you know, accomplished females and uh, many more coming through the pipeline, which you can, you can kind of see in your classes and see in terms of the gender distribution in, um, in the experimental articles uh, when those studies are run on campuses in psych departments. So it's, it's, a, it's a different world now. Do you feel like kind of, you know, a little bouncy in your step, like, yeah, I did this, and look at all these people coming behind me, and I kind of blazed the trail for them, and... Uh, no, I, you know? I don't think I walk around like that. <laughs> I mean, I, and someone could, but that that's sort of not me, really. Yeah. I, mean, I You know, I walk around kind of fending off one group of enemies over here, and then... <laughs> then I have my supporters over here that I look to when I need to be lifted up because yeah. of some recent attack from the enemies. <laughs> that, that's kind of how I walk. Yeah. Through. Yeah. I just think it's absolutely amazing that you're here with us because like all of us teach you, like all of us do. <laughs> and this is incredible for all of us. Um, are there any women in the field now who are like really doing some really great work that the world should know about? Oh, there are lots of uh, women doing fantastic work. Um, some of them have trained with me. So <laughs> I'd like to, you know, tell you about, you know, Marianne Gary, who worked with me, you know, as a postdoc. Um, and is now on the faculty in New Zealand. And then there are lots and lots of terrific uh, female psychologists. Marzu Banaji, who is the co-inventor of the IAT, the test of, of um, whether you are, are biased, uh, professor at Harvard. She was a postdoc uh, with me and, and with Claude Steele as well at, at, when I was back at my former university. I mean, I could just keep going on with uh, women. Yeah. Okay, so kind of a gender question, kind of a memory question. Um, 
Are there measurable differences among the genders with regard to like how our memories are formed or the strength of the memories? Any gender difference? In my own work on, on false memories, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you about out there in the whole big field of, of right. memory and cognition, whether they're um, gender differences, but I was um, uh, once looking at the question of whether one gender is more likely to, to be susceptible to misinformation or contamination through suggestion than, than the other gender. And what we basically found is that men and women tend to be interested in, in different things. And if you try to uh, mislead people about something they're particularly interested in, um, it, it might fail. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we had a very stereotypical result that the, you know, if you try to mislead the males about a car or the make or model of a car, they were less susceptible than, than the females. And the females were less susceptible to an attempt to contaminate them about, you know, somebody's clothing. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't too crazy about that result, but we did go ahead and publish it. Yeah, you know, results are results. Um, results are results. So what do you think, what do you wish that more people in general knew about memory and how memory works? So I, um, a few years ago, I, I did a TED talk in Scotland at TED Global. And there you have to condense your message into like 15 minutes. And I was trying to think then when I was preparing that talk, which is really so different from pre preparing for a class or even preparing for a colloquium or a, you know, conference talk. Uh, it's really quite a, uh, an exhausting and stressful experience. But I wanted to leave that audience, that broad audience with a take home lesson. And what I ended up concluding in the, my talk with was the message that just because somebody tells you something and they say it with a, a lot of detail, they express it with a lot of confidence, they even, they show emotion when they tell you, it doesn't mean it really happened. That you need independent corroboration to know uh, whether you're dealing with a, an authentic memory or one that's a product of some other process, imagination, suggestion, uh, or some other process. So I think that's the, you know, that's what I've learned in, <laughs> you know, 40 or 50 years of doing this work. So don't believe everything you think is real. <laughs> and when basically, it comes to yes. <laughs> and, 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 you know, well, another part of that is that once you appreciate the malleable nature of memory, it makes you a little more tolerant of the mistakes that your friends, your family, people around you, or even you yourself make. It's not necessarily a, you know, a big fat lie that it could be just a mistaken memory. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you mentioned your TED talk. Um, you've done a few. Um, tell us a little bit more about like what, what it was like aside from being super stressful and like, well, the first of all, um, okay, well, I, well the, actually, the, the, the main TED talk that I did was in Scotland, um, and they basically, you, it's a whole process. I mean, so you get invited, and then you have to write an outline, and then you write a draft of a, of a script. It's all, you know, kind of written out, and then they tell you it's too long. You got to cut it down. And then uh, I, I, you try to deliver it. Um, and I, mem I had to memorize it because unlike a class lecture where you have lots and lots of slides or PowerPoint slides that can walk you through, uh, and, and I could give one of those without, without notes, you, you memorize this TED Talk because it's going to be up there word for word, translated into you know, 30 or 40 different languages. And part of the value of it is, is the literary quality of it. And so I had to memorize it. It took me three months to memorize this, um, 
this 15 minute TED talk. And I used the method of loci, which the Greek, Greeks used in the ancient days to, to accomplish this memorization. Uh, it, it really gave me great appreciation for actors and actresses who, you know, have to memorize all these lines because this was a whole lot of work. Then when you get there, you have a dress rehearsal, um, the, the kind of a day or two before you're giving the talk. And then there you are, you know, on a stage with 900 people in the audience and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more um, live streaming it. And then now it's been viewed by, I don't know, close to 5 million people. But I ask you about your lunches with B.F. Skinner. Did, so you used to lunch with B.F. Skinner. And did you ever dine al fresco when he throws bread at the pigeons or anything like that? Um, fun stories? No, the way, <laughs> so the, well, the way it happened, um, I was, um, well, I finished grad school and I was, I was teaching. And I got this fellowship to go to Harvard for a year and to work in academic administration. I was kind of flirting with the idea that I might want to go into academic administration. And while I was uh, at Harvard for that year, I sent a letter to Skinner. This was way before internet, so we're dealing snail mail here. And, um, you know, I said that I was an experimental psychologist and I, you know, I said a couple of things about me and then I said I was here at Harvard for the year. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to have lunch with you once this year. And you know, five days later or something, the phone in my office, uh, my little basement windowless office at Harvard, uh, rang and he said, "Hi, it's Fred Skinner." And I'm, I, oh my God, I, I'm talking to Skinner. I, I couldn't even believe it. And he said you know, I'd be happy to uh, have lunch with you. So we met um, on the street in front of the restaurant. He took my arm. Uh, who says who says there's forgetting? I, when I remember all this detail from, from the 70s, he took my arm as we walked in and he said, women's lib aside, let me treat this time. And we went inside the restaurant and sat down and had lunch and, um, he talked about volume two of his autobiography. Uh, volume two, I think, covered the years, age, I'll make this up, but, you know, 10 to 20. I think volume one was zero to 10. Now he's doing 10 to 20. And so I'm listening to him tell me about volume two. It's not even finished yet. And I, it was very exciting to hear about the second volume of his autobiography you know, bef long before it was even going to be in print. And at the end of the lunch, I hardly said a word. He talked the whole time. Um, he said, you're a great conversationalist. Um, when can we do this again? And so we then we had another lunch. And that's how these lunches happened. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. I love that. So how many volumes of his autobiography did he end up I, well, You know, he had to get up to, you know, 90 or where, wherever he got to. So uh, yeah, there were, there were volumes after that. But um, That's great. Uh, yeah, so that, that was that was that experience. I okay. just want to interject, just like you were like, oh my goodness, I'm talking to Fred Skinner. That's how Jen and I feel right now about you. <laughs> oh my goodness, we're talking to Dr. Loftus. Yeah, yeah, really. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, we so after, true. yeah, we're going to fangirl after this pretty hard, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to share with everybody a little special something. And hopefully this... Psychobabble for 200. Works. According yeah. to a popular saying, this defense mechanism ain't just a river in Egypt. Bobcat? What is denial? Denial, yes. Psychobabble for 400. Researcher Elizabeth Loftus has found that she can invent these and have subjects take them as their own. Y'all can hear it, right? Okay. Psychobabble for 400. Researcher Elizabeth Loftus has found that she can invent these 
and have subjects take them as their own. Bobcat? What are memories? Right. Okay, so you were a Jeopardy question. Yeah, um, that, 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 was a, that was quite a shock. <laughs> So they didn't call you and say, hey, do you mind if we make you into a Jeopardy question? No, no. I think it was a student who told me about it after it had already was was on the air. And somehow uh, I managed to be able to find it and um, capture it. And, um, and I put in that 10 second pause so mm -hmm. that people, I can show it to students and they have to come up with the answer. <laughs> to show yeah. that they learned something, uh, but it, it, that was kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna send that out to everyone. Um, so if you wanted to use it in class to introduce her work, you can do that. Um, so there have been a lot of questions from our, our before we go into the like Q&A section. Um, you've been an expert witness for some pretty unpopular people. Um, can you speak to what that's like and why that's important work for you? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, you know, the bedrock of our democracy is, uh, at least one of them, um, is that when people are accused of something, they're supposed to be innocent till proven guilty, that um, people deserve a defense. Um, we can't just convict people based on, um, you know, say the media sensationalizing the stories of the horrific crimes and so on. And some people, some people are innocent. And along the way, uh, you know, I've testified for some people who've ended up being, ended up being guilty, not just found guilty, but probably really guilty. Um, but we have to have a, a system that works for unpopular people, so it's it's there for for the rest of the people. What would you? Is there one that stands out as like the toughest one you worked on, or one of the toughest? Well, people ask me a lot about Ted Bundy, um, but when I testified for Ted Bundy in 1976. We didn't know he was the Ted Bundy. Uh, he was a first year law student who was accused of a, a, an aggravated kidnapping, of trying to kidnap a woman from a parking lot of a shopping center. And she managed to uh, escape um, and would maybe nine months later or something go to a, an identification situation where she made an identification of Bundy and I was asked to testify in that case. I talked about some of the issues around the identification process, that long period of time, and some of the issues about the structure of the identification. Um, as I said, at the time, we didn't know he would be the Ted Bundy who would be convicted of that Utah crime, uh, would be extradited to Colorado to stand trial for another crime. And while he was in Colorado, he escaped from the jail and um, ended up in Florida. And, and you know, we know the rest. Yeah. Uh, but often now, you know, that, that gets thrown ag up against me in cross-examination when I'm testifying, say, for a current defendant. Well, didn't you testify for Ted Bundy? You, you know, you testify for anyone if you testify for him. But at the time, as I said, uh, we didn't know he was the Ted Bundy, and even if we did, he still obviously deserves to have a defense, and so that we know that if there's a conviction, at least it's done after a fair trial, and not the kind of trial uh, that people get in other parts of the world. So, um, Based on what we were just talking about, Beth Smith in Orlando asked if you were involved in the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, the Supreme Court Justice. Um, well, I wasn't involved in the hearings. Um, I did do a lot of interviews about uh, the Kavanaugh situation. And, you know, I'll tell you, that was, you know, that was a tough situation because you just listened to, um, 
you know, the accuser in that situation, and she's very credible. She's a psychology professor. She's articulate and, 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 and you know, just sounded compelling. Um, it, it, there's a strong tendency, and I felt it might to just want to say, oh my God, you know, this is so believable. But I actually had to remind myself wait a minute, this is 35 years ago, there's been psychotherapy, there's been all kinds of, you know, other publicity, it's first talked about in a psychotherapy session, wait a minute. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's sometimes tough to think uh, critically and um, when you, and to scrutinize the evidence when you have such a, you know, an appealing person telling their story, it's hard. Yeah, I would guess so. I do not envy you at all for that. Um, so um, Kate Ehrlich would like to know what you're currently working on, what's your current research? Uh, well, there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm just um, working on an essay right now with uh, one of my former graduate students, Rachel Greenspan, on um, misinformation ab about COVID and uh, and what maybe what we can learn in this infodemic of information and misinformation and disinformation that we're all living in right now what can um you know 50 years of of knowledge about the misinformation effect uh, teach us uh that might be helpful in this current pandemic that we're all suffering from so I've been having a, you know, a good time with this, my former student uh, trying to think through that application. Um, we, you know, I, I have collaborations with uh, somebody in uh, Ireland and we published a uh, paper uh, this year on a, a couple of papers on misinformation in the context of a, uh, a referendum on abortion that was taking place. So this is misinformation to actual voters in Ireland who would be voting on this, whether to re repeal these very restrictive abortion regulations that existed in, in Ireland. Um, and, and, and that's a really a great fun collaboration and thinking about memory distortion in the context of actual voters. Um, uh, this year, I uh, published uh, a paper on the effects of marijuana on susceptibility to false memories. And guess what? <laughs> you're, you're somewhat more susceptible. Um, probably not too surprising, but it, it's a, just a very clever procedure invented by these Dutch collaborators that uses a virtual reality event and to expose people to an event and to uh, supply them with misinformation. So, uh, you know, those are just a, a, a few of the the recent studies. Oh, um, um, uh, uh, with collaborators who got interested in the question of whether at, when somebody goes through one of these misinformation experiments and you debrief them and say, guess what, we fooled you and we used deception and gee, we're sorry, but here's what we did. And, here, here's some details about our experiment. What happens to those people? Um, we didn't know before, but we now know that, you know, a little bit of maybe bits and pieces of, of false information might still linger, but also going through the, these experiments produces a benefit. It gets people interested in psychology. It even, in one of the studies, inoculates them a little bit from a future attempt to mislead them. So even though, you know, even though they may still think it's a stop sign and not a yield sign, or that there was broken glass when there wasn't, uh, to use some older examples, um, we're also seeing some benefits. So you would say then that learning about false memories makes you a little less susceptible? Well, in one of the studies, in just one of the studies, it showed that. I, I don't know that it, it'll be a lasting effect. Uh, I, we don't know whether it'll work in, with other kinds of materials. All that needs to be worked out by future research. 
All right, so I have a question, that's kind of a combined question from Maria Vita at Penn Manor High School in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Maggie May of Villa Joseph Marie High School in Horsham, Pennsylvania. They would like to know, what's your favorite way to explain your research to students? And what do you think is the most important thing for high school students to take away from your research? Well, the takeaway is something that I already talked about earlier in this conversation. The, you know, that memory is malleable, that we do pick up information from different places and different times and um, pull it in to construct what feels like a memory. Um, it doesn't work like a video recording. Um, and I, at one point I likened it to a Wikipedia page. It works more like a Wikipedia page because you can go in there and edit your memory, but so can other people. <laughs> so that's kind of my take home. One of the things that I do in my um, undergraduate class on eyewitness testimony is I try to do a demonstration where I expose them to an event. So it might be the stop sign yield signs, the, the traffic accident where the car goes through a yield sign. And then I, supply some post-event suggestion that it was a stop sign. And then I try to get some of them at least to remember a stop sign, to recognize the scene with the stop sign so that they experience it for themselves. And uh, anyhow, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do, to just kick off uh, a discussion of memory. The other thing, of course, that motivates people to want to learn about memory and that I'm always like, introducing early on is the problem of wrongful convictions. And you just have to go to the Innocence Project's uh, website and you, where there are more than 350 cases where DNA has proven that these convicted uh, defendants were actually innocent after they'd spent 10, 15, 20 years in prison when those cases are analyzed, uh, more than 70% are due to faulty memory. And so this really motivates the students, I think, to want to learn about memory when they see that, that, that it is so crucial in these human tragedies. It's not just the 350 people, but then there are extended families who had to endure this suffering. Uh, and so you, you realize that memory, like liberty, is, is fragile. Yeah. Yeah. So most of us, sorry, John, do you mind if I just interject? Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, most of us probably show the picking cotton story from 60 Minutes, which I know you're interviewed in. Um, any other information about that specific case or just kind of in general? I love that case. Yeah, so my undergraduates, I, I show um, the, yeah, the 60 minutes uh, piece too. And, um, and it's just such a amazing story. The story of how, how this, these two people became not just one more case of a wrongful conviction, not just one more case of a wrongful conviction involving rape, not just one more case of a wrongful conviction involving a cross-racial identification, but the fact that they would get together after the DNA exoneration of Ronald and become friends and mm -hmm. go around the country trying to reform the system and trying to lecture about this. Um, so I've gotten to know uh, Jennifer I've seen her a number of times. In fact, I'm a Facebook friend of Jennifer's and Ronald's, but, but uh, Jennifer posts more often than, um, than Ronald does. And, you know, early on, if you would ask her, what is the face you see? This is after she knew it wasn't him. She said, I still see him. I still see Ronald Cotton when I think about the rape, but now she doesn't see anyone. Yeah. But she see Bobby Poole either, the real guy who did it. That's interesting. I, wow. I love using that in class and probably spend more time on it than mm -hmm. is probably necessary, but my students are enthralled with that 
case. And, and a lot of them are like, wow, this is also a really good lesson in forgiveness. And okay, the lesson for the forgiveness um, that he, the get, forgive, forgiveness gift that he gave her uh, yes. is, is stunning. Yeah, there's another aspect for me that, um, that you know, uh, that I think is unbelievable, you know, just so stunning is after Jennifer identified Ronald Cotton, he was convicted uh, at trial. She was a compelling witness. She's very charismatic and, and articulate and there were suspicions that it might be Bobby Poole. And so there was a, an event that was arranged for Jennifer to see Bobby Poole. And maybe she would change her mind and say, oh my God, what have I done? But she looked at Bobby Poole and said, no, it's not him. Ronald had become her memory. And this is exactly the kind of thing I study. So here we have this real live example of how there's been this substitution in memory. And even when the truth is staring you in the face now, it doesn't register anymore. Oh my goodness. Um, I just think that when I teach this again, I'm going to show my students the clip of you just saying that. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking the same thing, like this, this little, recording that we're doing might have to make it into my class because that was, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, not just so I can show my students, oh my gosh, look what I did this summer, but because <laughs> yeah. this is exciting. Like insider information. Yeah, okay, so if knowing what we know about memory and eyewitness testimony and memory, like should we even allow it <laughs> or? Well, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not gonna get rid of it. Right. Um, uh, because, you know, sometimes that's all there is. And sometimes the eyewitness testimony, you know, is, is pretty reliable. Um, I, I, I still get calls sometimes from lawyers who will, you know, spend 20 minutes on the phone with me, giving me, you know, the, the gist of, 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 of their fact situation for the client they're defending. And and sometimes I say, you know, I listen to that and I'm not sure there's much a, a memory expert can say that's gonna help you. I mean, you, you know, you have a long exposure time, you have a period of time where the two were together where it wasn't stressful, it was only at the end he decided to rob the person. You know, the, the identification is maybe a day later in a, in a coffee shop, uh, no police procedure, same race ide uh, identification, not much there to um to in terms of problematic factors that can pile up and make you suspicious that you might be dealing with a mistake yeah all right so i have another so one want that one thrown out uh, that that baby thrown out with the bath water so. yeah. <laughs> all right so here's another this one kind of has to do with the media and stuff so cami torgenrad of york high school in monterey california says, lacking strong, unbiased media, how can we preserve national memory when forces left and right boldly manipulate the narrative? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think we just need to be aware of how um, not only are our personal autobiographies susceptible to contamination, distortion, transformation, but so are collective memory for, for common events that, you know, that, that we share. Um, there's an unbelievably interesting study by a British uh, psychologist named Rob Nash, who happens to be my uh, academic great grandson. Um, and he showed that if you show people doctored photographs of a, a public event, and this happened to be Will and Kate right after their wedding, leaving the, the wedding ceremony in, in, the, in the car transport. You can show doctored photographs where the streets are lined with protesters and, and, and a lot of commotion and so on. And showing a doctored photograph affects the way people remember that event. And even when the Photoshopping is so bad, that is so fake looking, 
the horse's feet aren't even on the ground, it still influences the way people remember uh, that event and and their their feelings about it. So, you know, we we need to worry about the ability of people to manipulate us with doctored photographs, and then even worse uh, with the deep fake technology that is now going to get in the hands of more and more people. <clears throat> Excuse so, me. Our, the next question from Sabrina M. Key of Evanston Township High School in Evanston, Illinois. This kind of goes along with what we were just talking about. How do you see social media contributing to people's memories? Is it helping, harming, or is there a combination? Specifically with social media. Um, well, sometimes things can help and, and sometimes they can harm. I mean, you can be reminded of things and, 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 and have shared experiences and, so, and pleasant things and, and, and re refreshing and accurate memory. Um, but sometimes it's harmful. And what, sometimes when the media presents a sensationalized account of something, um, in order to have it be interesting to readers or whatever the motivation is, um, but maybe it's a little exaggerated or incomplete, it can affect the way people reconstruct their own personal experience of a related kind. And um, so that's that's the downside. Yeah, I, I feel that social media <clears throat> is one of those things that like, <laughs> it's there and, it can be for good or it can be for evil and uh, yeah. Um, so the next one, how, and you might've already addressed this a little bit, but how do you see your work on the misinformation effect or false memories reflected in this whole fake news, alternative facts and different truths or other current events that might make it helpful for us to teach these concepts and draw in like current stuff to engage the students? Um, one thing we did in, in my work on uh, false memories uh, with my cl wonderful collaborators is to show that false memories have repercussions, that they can affect um, what people say, what, how, what they think, what their intentions are, and even how they behave. If you plan a false memory that you got sick eating a particular food like strawberry ice cream, people don't want to eat that food as much. That's a, a repercussion of the false memory. And I think in, in, in the current situation, sadly, when people push misinformation out there onto the world and, and other people receiving that misinformation, let's say about COVID, let's say about you know whether masks can be dangerous and you know cause you to have uh, as one politician says increase your chances of getting covid because uh, somehow the dirty mask will push the covid up against your nose um it's going to have repercussions if people buy into it and believe it it'll it 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 it, it, it can lead to death so I, I, I see a connection there between the susceptibility to misinformation um, and its consequences that can be lethal in this case. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even know, like why aren't we calling false information lies or alternative facts, why aren't those lies? Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, Meg, shh, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess this up. Meg Shadid uh, of Olathe Northwest High School in Olathe asks, "What role do you think psychologists have in political advocacy?" I, I believe that people, you know, have to find their own thing that interests them. Um, uh, for me, you know, I have been worried about wrongful convictions and 
what happens to innocent people and their extended families when accusations are false. And, and maybe there's been some advocacy around that concern. It's something I choose to do. But not everybody wants to do that. And, and not everybody has to do that. If, if it's a passion, go for it. Uh, if you'd rather just stay in, in the laboratory and do the basic scientific work and not be out there in the real world, um, uh, but maybe your work will be very useful for the real world, then, then live your life that way. I, I mean, I think people just need to choose the way they want to live. So with your, um, do you work directly with um, the Innocence Project and all of that? Like, um, or just kind of like, I, um, I don't know quite how, to, I mean, I've worked on many of the cases that are. So what well, I guess what I'm asking the is. Cases that, that find their way into um, these innocence databases. Um, I've, I've, I've met and um, many times um, the founders of the Innocence Project in New York. Um, in fact, they are, are the ones who consulted briefly with me on the O.J. Simpson case. Oh, and at UC Irvine, we now have the National Registry of Exonerations, which is a database of now more than 2,000 exonerations. And occasionally I'll work with somebody, um, you know, doing some analysis of some part of, some piece of the data from the National Registry's database. So you're kind of there like they know that you're there to help if they need your help and kind of thing. Yeah, usually, usually I'd be helping out on a specific case or in the case of the UC Irvine uh, project, um, you know, I'm on the board of directors of the institute that where, where it's housed. So I'm, I'm kind of involved as a board member in what's happening with the registry. Okay, so I have a question from Beth Carlson of Orange County Public Schools in Orlando. Um, are there any like research studies, interviews, books, or podcasts that you think are really good that might be of interest to our high school students related to memory or social justice or like anything? Birds, anything? Well, um, uh, gee, I don't, I, I mean, even, even, well, of course you don't need, I, I was, you know, what comes to mind, I guess, because we talked about the Ronald Cotton cases is, is the book Picking Cotton. Um, I love that. Uh, I love their book and how they tell their story and chapters, each from their own perspective. Um, gee, I, I mean, I'm not sure there's one specific podcast. I, I end up showing um, showing videos that sometimes I find, you know, online YouTube videos that that will, well, particularly when I'm talking about the memory wars, you can find these videos of of either people who were claiming they had repressed memories um, or people who were accused by someone based on a repressed memory, and they're on a talk show and. So those are, I think, pretty interesting to watch, especially given that when these talk shows occurred in the early 90s, the audience was just totally eating up these repressed memory stories and without any kind of critical eye to whether it was making sense and why was there no corroboration? Um, so, Anyhow, that, yeah, yeah. There, there, that's a good place to go, probably, too. Well, and I'm also going to be looking up this um, study by Rob Nash and mm -hmm. the one from the Dutch people about the susceptibility to um, false memories in marijuana use, because I think my students would really... Yeah, well, email me, because I have those on my hard drive. Okay. I can so send, send them to you uh, easily, so you don't... It's, that'll make it easier for you. Yeah, I'm always trying to find, like current stuff to bring into the students and a lot of times I have to we have to kind of you know break it apart into pieces because 
you know, there's okay. so much in there and you have to like highlight here, are like the five paragraphs I want you to focus on. Yeah. Um, but I, anytime <clears throat> that, and actually I think I had read something about, I think I made a, like a question on a quiz about something like that. I might've read it in the monitor on psychology or something. This is where I usually find things. Um, so someone asked it that w said one of her students had watched your TED talk and felt afterwards as a survivor of um, sexual abuse that she was, she felt like she was being called a liar. Do you have any kind of, you know, take on that? It, I'm sure you get that a lot. <laughs> well, I don't get exactly that. I mean, I may get a cousin of that question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing in that TED talk about calling people a liar. Right. It's right. all about, in fact, my work is a way not to call somebody a liar. It's not, it's not about deliberate lying. When people have a mistaken memory about who did it, when they genuinely are a victim, and certainly the Steve Titus case, which I used to open the TED talk, there really was a rape and she really was a victim she just happened to identify the wrong person. Um, so, you know, anyhow, there's, yeah. so I think it, yeah. it, it's so far off the mark, but you know, a, a cousin of that question or maybe a, a related question would be something like, you know, do you worry that your work might be used by somebody who's really guilty to, to try to get off? And that could happen. That, I mean, I think, I think some guilty people will say, I'm innocent, and you've got a, you've got a false memory, and um, there's all kinds of research on that. Um, and that's something that, we, that is sad, but is, is certainly possible. So is it, is it possible for someone who has something traumatic happen to them to remember it the right way like how does that happen if something traumatic is happening to you just like the um the jennifer case she's like she's being raped and she's like trying to encode this man's face and then she ends up being wrong so like can we trust ourselves to form memories correctly when we're involved in some something traumatic uh, I, uh sometimes you know sometimes memory is accurate and and i just think we need to you know when somebody's liberty is at stake and when there are a whole lot of problematic factors we just have to think very carefully and not just accept the story because it's delivered with a lot of detail and confidence i think that's the that's the only lesson from from this research but but obviously we, we, we remember things and, and probably though we sometimes think we remember things when we aren't. I'm thinking of the flashbulb memories now where, where people are very confident about where they were when they heard the news mm -hmm. about 9-11 or about the explosion of the Challenger. Mm -hmm. And the studies are showing that a couple of years later, all kinds of people make all kinds of mistakes, even with those, you know, highly upsetting public events. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you about people who have the superior autobiographical memory. Like, are they less susceptible to false memories or more susceptible or? Is They're an amazing it? group of people. These, um, They've been studied by my colleagues here at UC Irvine in uh, neurobiology and behavior. Um, they remember just about everything they did every day of their adult life. They've been um, featured a couple of times on 60 Minutes mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, maybe even showing a 60 Minutes video that can show what these people can do. It's just astonishing. They're very special. Uh, and so, the neurobiology lab and my lab got together to do an experiment where we would subject these 
highly superior memory people to these false memory studies? Would they be resistant? Would they be just as susceptible? And what I loved about this study is it, it really didn't matter how it, how it came out, it was gonna be interesting. Um, and what we ended up finding is that these highly superior memory people were just as susceptible to contamination in the standard false memory paradigms as the H gender match controls. Uh, so um, that was a paper that we published just, just a few years ago. But that, that, the person earlier who asked about, you know, interesting videos, those 60 minute videos on the, they call them HSAMs, H-S-A-M, highly superior autobiographical memory. And is, one of them has Mary Lou Henner in it. I think. Yes. I think I yes. show, yeah, I show yeah. one of those. I'm like, oh, Mary Lou Henner, she's an actress. And the kids look at me like, uh huh? They've <laughs> never heard of her, I know. Never <laughs> They've never heard of her, but you know. <laughs> I mean, I've had to update some of my examples uh, to Lady Gaga when it was, you know, somebody else that nobody ever heard of. Yeah, I, I thought I was old when students didn't get my Seinfeld references anymore. And then they stopped getting my Friends references. And then, and now they get the Friends references because they've all watched it a hundred times on Netflix. So that makes me feel a little bit better. Not less old, but it makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Um, okay. So you have this um, amazing library ladder behind you with all- Yeah, I do, I love books. my ladder. Yeah. Tell me what, what's going on back there? Yeah. Well, first of all, this is, I spent a whole lot of time in this office now. I always did on the weekends, but usually I was at the campus, the main campus uh, office during the week. But, but this is my home office ladder and it goes all the way up. And um, uh, I have the enemy books up there on the top shelf, the ones that I don't need to read very often. Um, and then the friend, friendly books, you know, the, the skeptic books, the wrongful conviction books, the uh, right, at, easy, easy to reach on a lower shelf. So that's what's going on, on my bookshelf. Your enemy books are the ones, the repressed memory people? Yes, the ones who are touting the whole repressed memory, you know, business, and yeah. <laughs> we have another question here that I just noticed. Um, have you been emotionally or mentally conflicted as you've given testimony in some of the high profile cases? Because I know yes. you've gotten a lot of like harassment and whatnot in some of these cases, but how did that affect you emotionally or mentally? Well, I, I mean, I, uh, the most recent example is, you know, the Harvey Weinstein case. But um, in fact, I, uh, when I first began to work on the case very early on, when there was hardly any media coverage of the cases in Los Angeles, um, you know, I began to look into this. By the time I um, was speaking with the New York lawyers, there had been so much publicity, bad publicity about him. Uh, that I, w I, I was conflicted. Um, I did um, attempt to give the case away to another expert witness um, and almost almost succeeded in doing that. But, um, but Harvey really insisted that he wanted to have my testimony. Uh, and it was pure basic memory, not any testimony about any specific people, even the judge wouldn't even allow it. That's a little unusual. Um, and I basically said to myself, the only reason you don't want to do it is because you, you've been seduced by the media coverage and you've been fighting the world, telling them they can't get seduced by the media coverage. It's not fair and you're afraid of what this might do to you and your ability to help other people. So I would feel like a coward if I walked away. And so I didn't walk away. And, you know, I've, I've paid for it. You know, I've had my share of uh, nasty emails and nasty voicemails and um, more than a few uh, listenings to the C word uh, and, and others that are just as bad. Um, to uh, 
to last me for, for a while. Okay, so I have one last question. Um, so Jacqueline Parslow in Rancho Cucamonga, I just wanted to say that word actually. Um, she, she wants to know how, um, how do you see the ap applicability of your research on memory to today's current events regarding police brutality? Is there any link between that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting question because um, it, it, it's such a sensitive issue. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I, it, we, you know, you don't always know the whole story when you see just the bit that's shown in the news. You don't always know the whole story. I mean, I mean, so, and sometimes, sometimes you know enough of the story to know it's horrible. It's horrible. But you do have to keep in mind you don't always know the whole story. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we as teachers need to really instill in our students as we make them critical thinkers is just like, look for more evidence, look for more evidence, look for more evidence every time and not to just take what you see in a, you know, 15 second video on TikTok or Facebook or whatever they're on as the be all end all truth. And right. I think your research really helps students see that there's like science behind it. And it's not just someone saying, well, this is what it is because it is. Right. Um, so I think that your work is one of the things that I hope that my students leave my class and are like, wow, that's kind of a big deal. I really should pay attention to, you know, facts and make sure that I have things correct before I go and like spread that along. Because mm -hmm. life isn't a big old game of telephone. Um, all right, so we are at the end of our time together. I wanted to thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Oh, and my pleasure. I I cannot tell you like I'm gonna probably run out of this room and giggle, and it's gonna be awesome. And I know that this has been really great for the teachers that have been watching, and we just really appreciate your time and. Um, answering all the ridiculous silly questions. I'll say one last thing, Jess, Jacqueline Parslow also said, like she wanted to thank you because she served as a juror in a murder trial where eyewitness was a major part of the evidence. And she felt like she was a more objective juror because she knew about your research. Oh, that's I good, think, that's good to hear. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, a good takeaway for all of us too. It's not just something we're teaching, but it does, it, may apply to our lives and that's that's important for us to understand too so thank you very much okay my pleasure all right thank you everyone we will put this up uh, at some point uh for y'all to view later and thank you for coming we'll see you at our next okay time. bye thank you bye